Hello and welcome to the Robot Podcast. I'm Fran Scott, scientist, maker and massive engineering fan. Every week, we'll be finding out how robots are pushing the boundaries and exploring the exciting future that robots can bring. From 3D printing buildings to simulated factories, from robots in education to those working in our retail warehouses, technology is completely transforming our everyday tasks and leading us towards a more innovative future. Some of you, and me, will remember that long process of connecting to the internet, especially those those sounds that you hear, the dialing up, waiting to be given access to just a few websites. Um, And now if this sounds like another world, (laughs) consider yourself lucky slash young. Technology has absolutely transformed the way we live our lives. And it's estimated that 127 new devices are connected to the internet every single second. So this episode is all about the past, present and future of technology and robotics. How much has changed in the last decade and what is in store for the next one? I'll be speaking with Dr. Sami Atia, Head of Robotics and Discrete Automation at ABB, about how the industry is adapting to the challenges of today. And with Dan Jeevens, Vice President of Digital Innovation at Shell whose role is all about adapting to the technology trends in the near future. But first, our producer Izzy Clark spoke to Dr. Kate Devlin from King's College London to find out how much technology has influenced our everyday lives in the past 10 years. I would start by saying that the smartphone is probably the main thing, that rise in acceptance of it. And it's become a ubiquitous part of our everyday lives. So now we don't tend to go out the door without our phones. Before that, we might have checked that we had our keys in our wallets. Who needs a wallet now? We've got everything we want to pay for right there on our phone. All we have to do is just swipe our phones to get us onto public transport or to buy a coffee in the shop. So I think that's been really, really key. And if you think of that nervousness you feel when you realise that you've, you can't find your phone, you've left it down somewhere, where is it? Um, just that whole sense of being connected is thanks to the rise of the smartphone. And I know that some people get very concerned that perhaps we overuse these things, but that's how we communicate now and we are adapting to it and it's not going to go away. So it's not a case that we're using phones too much. It's a case that we are now mediating our lives and carrying out our everyday jobs, everyday life through those phones. Okay, so we've got the phones covered. What about other things? Like I'm I'm looking around my room now and there's seems to be a lot more technology just within home itself. Yes, that's right. So we have seen other pieces of technology that have come out. So, for example, the streaming services that arose over the years have been really influential. So we no longer need to own music in a physical format. Voice assistants have been phenomenally quick to be taken up. And now we're very used to giving commands to these. Essentially, they're just conversational search engines. So we just issue instructions and they reply to us. They can't hold a conversation, but we treat them as if they can. And I'm not going to use their names here because they may actually set off some people's voice assistants in their home. (laughs) But we've got used to moderating our conversations so that we begin sentences with the names of those assistants to get their attention. So that's become something that's been Uh, it's had a really big influence as well and then you can connect those to different things too so you can connect your voice assistant for example to smart plugs or smart light bulbs you can tell your robot vacuum cleaners to go and clean the floor via the voice commands it really really has been a rapid takeoff part of that's due to the way that we as humans interact so we're very comfortable to communicate via conversation and so for us it's it's quite a natural thing to be able to talk to these machines as if they understand us in our natural language even though they they don't really it's very limited their functionality what has driven that change if we look at the things that have gone well for us and things that we rely on now what drove that change for us to go from 10 years to where we are now was it our demand Or was it that technology has just been constantly improving? Definitely, there's been an improvement in technology. Uh, That's why we see the rise of these things. And but the other thing is uh, the way that the technology and the data is being generated. So we've reached a stage now where 
we as humans are generating huge amounts of data every day and that data can be used um, by systems such as AI, such as uh, machine learning, which means that it can, it can drive some very powerful algorithms uh, that allow us to benefit from the technology. So without, it's been the sort of perfect timing of an increase in computing power, but also an increase in data and, and being able to look for patterns in those data then powers other things. How would you say technology has influenced us? I mean, this is something that you you look into quite a lot. How would you say technology has influenced our everyday life and our use of it? Oh, there's so many ways that, that we get influenced by the technology we use. And if you think about the smartphones, even the way we inhabit space, the way that we interact with our technology physically has changed. So if you're walking down the street and you have, say, some kind of map software open, it might be giving directions to you through headphones or you might be looking at the screen as you navigate. So you're no longer having to stop and try and find your bearings in a new place. Or perhaps you're waiting at the bus stop or you're sitting on the tube reading things um, on your phone. So you're always engaged with it. It changes the way you actually move. And then... There are things like the robotic assistants, the virtual um, assistants, which means we change the way we say things. Uh, these are voice assistants, so you only need to give them three words. You know, you give them the name of the voice assistant and then say weather, London, and it should just give you the results. But we don't. We like to chat to it. We start behaving as if it's another person, even though we're perfectly aware that it isn't, because we deal with tech on a very social basis. And just out of curiosity, you know, how have you felt, obviously, working in this field, seeing this change? You know, would you say it's been quite a rapid one in, of the past decade or would you say it's in line with how technology has progressed from, you know, say the 10 years before that? I think it's changing more and more rapidly these days. And certainly when I started teaching in this area, in about 2006, 2007, I remember telling my students, oh, someone's invented multi-touch. We're going to see smartphones soon and you'll be able to touch the screens to interact. And the next thing that was the main way that we're interacting. And then suddenly voice commands have come out and out of nowhere and taken over really quickly. So those kind of advances have happened really, really fast. But I'm really a tech optimist. I am cautious about some things and I do get worried if things are being developed without due consideration. But overall, I think we're doing pretty well and there's some really cool stuff going on. There absolutely is. That was Dr. Kate Devlin from King's College London. That's the previous 10 years covered. Oh, where did they go? And um, But where are we now with technology? We live in this constantly changing world and it needs to provide solutions to not only the challenges of today, but ones that are also future proof. So how is the robotics industry responding to that? Who better to ask than Dr. Sami Atiyah, Head of Robotics and Discrete Automation at ABB. Now, you might remember Sami from the first ever episode of the Robot Podcast. But safe to say, so much has happened in the last year. So Sammy kicked things off by telling me what he had learned since we last spoke. Well, I think really we can all agree, you know, the way we work has changed more in the past year than uh, in the past 30 years. Uh, but this is not the first time that, you know, in history that we see these leaps in society and, and technology. If you, you know, think of the 1960s where... We had the space race where, you know, pushing forward science and advancing rockets. But what the outcome was that the microchip technology really advanced in a way that was never imagined before. And in 1990s, the technology boom that had actually led to the birth of the Internet and made people really connect uh, to, to each other. The pandemic has been advertly really giving us another great leap in technology. Customers, they want everything now they want it customized to, to who they are and they want it delivered sustainably. So that's a huge demand. And that's the next 10 years was pulled in one single year. So it's really amazing. And I think we all felt it as well, didn't we? Yes, yes. <laughs> so we're talking about the technology of today and we just can't ignore the topic of sustainability because that is such a strong driver. What are you seeing happen in the world of robotics and how is ABB responding to that? 
I personally, you know, believe that this topic should be on the top of, uh, of everybody's business agenda. Not only what is produced, but also how it's packaged. Less than 10% of the 380 million tons of plastic produced globally every year is actually recycled. So we have a huge responsibility ahead of us, and we have multiple technologies that actually can support. At the COP26 climate conference, we partnered uh, with an NGO, partly for the ocean, to showcase how robotics can address the problem of ocean plastic by reclaiming it and using 3D printing to make furniture and other solid uh, structures. And this is a practical way to help island communities most affected by plastic weight to reclaim. So it's really a local solution. And I suppose recycling is one thing, but not producing waste in the first place is also a big, has big impact. Well, uh, there are also new examples in a traditional industry in the automotive. Um, We call it pixel paint. We're very, very proud that. That automotive industry, this is a new paint technology called pixel paint, uh, which can precisely apply 100% of paint to the car, removing the waste um, you know, up to 30%. It's basically like your inkjet uh, printer technology used in, uh, uh, in painting cars. It's not only cool because uh, you know, it reduces weight, but also you can actually print the shapes you would like, like the picture of a of a cat on your car and so on. It's all possible with the technology today and it's sustainable. So it's cool. (laughs) And and in terms of that personalization, when it comes to the pixel paint, um, who doesn't want a cat on their car, first of all? (laughs) Absolutely. It is something that we touched on in the first series, this explosion in personalization for customers. So what does that mean for the robotics industry? Well, the as if I may probably use the right word, I mean, the e-commerce had, uh, has exploded. I mean, it was already on the rise before the pandemic, but, you know, we've seen a meteorotic uh, you know, rise of e-commerce over the last, uh, just last one and a half years. I mean, you know, the past year, you know, just a year, the internet sales and the European Union grew by 30% between April 2019 and April 2020, just in one year. And with similar growth rates in the US, UK, and China, people are actually willing to pay more for a personalized service. And 41% of, um, of consumers globally are actually willing to pay for same-day delivery. So think of that uh, you know, demand on the, on the chain, that somewhere somebody's clicking that button, and then there's a factory that needs to react in a way and the logistic chain that in a matter of less than 24 hours that is produced, delivered to your home, or you can pick it up somewhere. So uh, this really has, has a dramatic impact on you know, the need for flexibility and scale of our customers. And, and their robotization and automation is really at, at the core what, uh, what, uh, what, they, what they need. It's a huge ask that, just thinking about it in terms of next day delivery is a huge ask, let alone producing a personalized product and getting it delivered. And basically what you're saying is we can only have that with robots. Yes, I mean, you'll have to have multiple channels. And in these channels, you have to have high warehouse automation using AMRs, AMRs, autonomous mobile robots, robots themselves. So the flexibility of storing and flexibly getting them, retrieving them out is one of the big challenges because you can imagine these, we're talking about thousands and thousands of units that, that are shipped in and shipped out on the same same day. And you need to have the automation. So with human uh, you know, work alone, as it happened in the past, you know, we confuse you know, all of this. So the demand is so high that you need to have the automation. And that brings us on to another of the hot topics, which is a demographic one, isn't it? And it's it's all about the shortage of skills and labor that you need. Yes. I mean, this is one of the, the key drivers that uh, we've seen. And you just saw the examples, you know, in the UK with the truck driver shortage, what that causes. And look at the issue of offloading cargo at ports in the US. In September, 73 cargo ships queued outside ports in uh, in California waiting to dock uh, there is usually no more than one ship waiting uh, and you know you know 
you can imagine what is the real burden on economy when this happens, when, when, when we have these shortages, uh, you know, come into effect. So I assume there was a queue because there was no human dock workers there. How can robotics help to get things moving again? Well, automation is really the answer there. Take the example at Tianjin port uh, where uh, we have robots securing containers at the port in China. So after robot a crane has delivered uh, the container to the vehicle, a robot looks um, into a vehicle. AI enables you know, the robot to learn its task and operate it without any human interaction. So our robots are, are serving 30 container trucks per hour. That's that's really a huge impact. That's amazing because lo- loading a ship is not easy. Yes. And so to have that all automated in terms of weight distribution and where things are going to go and how you load it up, that's incredible. That leads us in to the future. And in this episode, we are looking at the past, present and future and AI, so artificial intelligence. And this is very much a part of the next generation of robotics. So just in case some of our listeners don't know, Sammy, could you sum up what AI is? Well, AI is uh, using software technologies to allow a robot or a computer to perform tasks that usually uh, we think only humans can do like, you know, decision-making, visual perception, or even speech recognition. So what you teach a robot is is to learn as it goes. So you you teach the robot, you know, this is a picture of the cat. You show many, many pictures of the cat. And then you show a picture of the dog, say, no, no, this is not a cat. And then ultimately, you show a a new picture of a cat. And then the system would say, "Uh uh-huh, this is a cat, and this is not a cat. And that's where the reinforced learning comes from. It's sort of you praise the computer, praise the software when it gets exactly. it right. Yes, you tell, um, yes, you did a good job. This is a good job. This is a bad <laughs> job. And <laughs> it's very similar to us as uh, as humans. And uh, and then the computer, you know, learns and uh, uh, learns that go. But I must say also, because, the, you know, some of the listeners might say, well, this is going to replicate us and change and take over our jobs. It is in a very confined space. You have to define the task. So, I I keep getting back to this box picking. Um, It is really box picking. And, you know, it is, you know, reinforcement learning in terms of, you know, welding or doing specific, but, you know, and then telling the the robot, you know, walk around here and then move, you know, the apple from this side to the other side. We are still far away from from, from that. It totally makes sense. If robots are going to be adaptable and are going to move on, that they... Uh, they need to progress beyond just that basic programming. And yes. so AI just naturally comes into play. So what is next for AI in robotics? So learning and mobility. So we use what we call reinforcement learning so that our robots can work in an uncontrolled environment and learn and adapt to task by repeating them. So this, I think this is really a critical step in continuing to move robots from fixed point on a factory floor to work alongside people and in new places such as warehouse, retails, uh, restaurants. And, and then when you add to it that autonomous mobility will enable the next generation of intelligent robots. So it's very much really the next big thing. And in China alone, the world's largest robotics market, annual AMR sales, are projected to be 1.8 billion by 2025. So, Sammy, imagine you've got a crystal ball and what are your predictions for the future? So today, uh, when I imagine the future, I see robots embedded in the in the workplace. In this upcoming decade, I can see finally, you know, merging the digital world and the physical world to make, you know, smarter solutions for a wide range of applications that serve um, our current challenges, and there are a lot. So robotics hardware that is automated, networked, and controlled by intelligent you know, software that makes them more and more and more autonomous. With this kind of intelligence, robots are going to be as familiar in our lives as, as smartphones. So this is the decade when we really would change the way we work. It is the decade where we make work more rewarding, safer, healthier, and more productive. And it's a decade when we will see new possibilities we have not imagined before. Dr. Samia thank you so much. 
So it sounds like there is going to be a lot of exciting change in the next decade. But I want to go back to something that Sammy said at the beginning. And he said that sustainability needs to be on the agenda for every business. And that certainly applies when you're exploring roles of future technology. Dan Jeevans is the Vice President of Computational Science and Digital Innovation at Shell. His role explores where technology is going in the next two to five years and how Shell is adapting to that. We all know that shifting from fossil fuels to renewable energy is a monumental task. And of course, there is growing societal pressure to accelerate the decarbonisation of the energy system. Shell wants to be and should be net zero by 2050 or sooner. But with that comes a lot of challenges. Dan and I had a chat about the future of artificial intelligence and robotics, starting with how vital artificial intelligence is to cutting carbon. I mean, I think it's one of the, the key elements of moving towards a lower carbon energy system. I mean, if you look at many of the situations that we're, we're observing around the world right now, I think what people are starting to realize just how difficult it is to fully decarbonize the energy system. And I think one of the things that's very obvious is there's no silver bullet. There's not going to be one solution. There's going to be many. We're going to see a variety of solutions to things like uh, electrification of heavy industrial activity. And as we go through that journey, the more complex the system becomes, the more data it generates. And as a result, what we're going to see is that AI is going to play a crucial role in orchestrating the energy system of the future. And so what have you done so far in terms of with AI? Yeah, no, so, so, so a lot is the answer. And I think what we have to bear in mind is that AI has the potential to help us build the energy system of the future, but it also has a huge implication for the energy system of now because we can use AI to make the existing energy assets much more effective and efficient. So a recent example I'd like to talk about is something we've done at one of our liquefied natural gas plants. What we've done there is we worked with that site to actually provide an algorithm which could optimize the CO2 footprint in their process by reducing boil off gas. Now, just let me put that in perspective. What that's doing is it's making sure that we don't emit CO2 by effectively flaring that gas into the atmosphere. Flaring is a very important process because it takes pressure out of the system and, and it keeps it safe. But at the same time, you want to minimize that as much as you possibly can or ideally eliminate it. And what we've seen is that by using AI, we were able to take at the equivalent of 57,000 European vehicles off the road with a single algorithm. Now, that's a powerful example, which is very tangible of how you can deploy AI solutions into real world assets and, and have a material impact on the CO2 emissions of those sites. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. So this being the robot podcast, how do robotics fit into this, Dan? Oh, that's a great question. So, so <laughs> I mean, obviously, I mean, as everybody will be aware, AI and robotics in the ultimate scenario for, for that is going to be robots, uh, where we're going to have a large amount of robots in the field doing all sorts of things. I think the key thing to be aware of really is that I talk about a second wave of AI a lot at the moment, because if you look at where we've been, a lot of the successful deployments of AI have been relatively dumb, if I can put it that way, relatively simple and actually certainly true in large enterprises. I think where we're going uh, is towards a world where the machine starts to inform the human and the human starts to inform the machine and both are learning together in a sort of symbiotic relationship. And I think that's going to be very powerful. And, and the, you know, the technology that I think is driving this to a large extent is what we call reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning where we see a lot of applications starting to hit uh, the mainstream. And one example is driverless cars, but there's many more applications for that. And, and I think inspection tasks are a really good example of this, where we're starting to see the, the combination of deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, and also really next generation robotics all coming together. We're already starting to see the ability of robots and drones to fly above our facilities 
take pictures and to automatically recognize things that previously you would have required a specialized inspector to do. And of course, what we what I think is going to evolve from there is that these robots are trained to then take a certain set of actions afterwards uh, based on a set of taught tasks. So what are the challenges that we're facing? I assume there are a few. There's a lot of challenges in this space. So, I mean, I think one of the big worries for me is is ethics and another one is cybersecurity. And just to touch on those, you have to be very careful when you're training these agents, because, of course, as a human, if we don't either A, get the data sets right or B, if we start to bring our own biases and experience to the agents, you can magnify those things very, very easily. And, And the examples, you know, some of the things we've seen with facial recognition, some of that's been very concerning, particularly some of the racial aspects of that. I think another example, we've been particularly concerned about things like the deployment of AI into hiring processes, because you have to be so careful with these sorts of things. And so um, so I think that's going to be a key area of research. And then the second is um, malevolent action. So, you know, we've seen an, an uptick in in cybercrime during COVID, as digital increases, so too does cybercrime. Uh, and those threats are getting ever more sophisticated. And so as the systems get more intelligent and more autonomous, so too magnified is the threat. I think in the energy sector, you know, I would add to that, that the challenge that the system is changing. And at the same time, these capabilities are advancing and you're trying to marry those two changes simultaneously. And change on change is always very difficult for humans to actually adapt to. And so it's actually the pace of change that worries me the most, because we're going to have to move faster than we've ever moved before to transform the energy system. And so that's going to take some real behavioral adaption, both in in the workplace, but also in society, to be able to take advantage of that. So where is the future going? And I suppose what, when it comes to the future developments, which ones are you most excited about? I, I think for me, it's actually the coming together of different technologies. And I think it's also going to require humans and machines to interoperate in ways that we have we can't anticipate currently. If you look at the physical infrastructure, this transformation has been happening over time for a long time. So the example I use is the car manufacturing line. If anyone's ever seen one, it's all robots and the humans interact with the robots and the humans come in and do certain checks, but the robots do most of the work, but actually they almost interoperate seamlessly. And digitally, I see the world going exactly the same way. And again, you know, going to the very simple example, the robotic vacuum cleaner is an example of this. We've got, you know, I have my heating system, I have my robotic vacuum cleaner. They're both by different manufacturers, but they integrate with the same control pane. You're going to have exactly the same thing starting to emerge within big companies, within other institutions, uh, within government. And that's where I see a lot of excitement about how this can really transform the way in which we operate normal everyday processes, which are going to be completely transformed by this. You look at something like a field operative who's trying to operate a a site, could be a wind farm, could be a refinery producing things like synthetic aviation fuel in the future. These folks are going to have a completely different experience than they have today. You know, a lot of the surveillance is going to be done remotely. Much of the activity is going to be done by robots and drones. But there's going to be a really crucial role for the human in all of that in orchestrating how these things come together. And we're going to be able to be much more effective by harnessing the power of these uh, new capabilities. So I think it's a very exciting future. I have huge positivity about where we're going as long as we pay attention to some of the risks that we talked about. Some wise words from Dan there and... Personally, I'm really excited to see where the next 10 years will bring us. It was only, I would say, 60 years ago that a washing machine or a dishwasher was such innovative technology. And those have actually freed up our time for us to do loads of other things. So my mind just boggles at what tasks will become automated that I just don't think can be and how they benefit me and free me up to do the things that I really want to do. And that is it for this week. A huge thank you to Dr. Kate Devlin, Dr. Sami Atia, and Dan Jeevans. Next week, it's all about sustainable construction. From 3D printing homes to robotics working on construction sites. 
I'm Fran Scott, and the Robot Podcast is a Fresh Air production for ABB. Follow or subscribe now for free wherever you get your podcasts.